hello everyone. It's hi. Hi Jays. It's gonna be one of those talks, I guess. <laughs> wow, that's lovely. Amazing stuff. Um, so for, for the three people in this room, this is not a humble brag, but for the three people in this room who don't know I am, I'm Kim Forrest. Um, I have to stay here because th that's the way the mic works. Um, anyway, thank you for coming to my GCAP talk. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so I greatly appreciate the support that's turned out. Um, and it is really lovely to see so many familiar faces uh, in the room, people that have, have made a big contribution to my journey through this industry. Um, so this is like, there's a, bit of, there's a fair bit of pride in this for me, to be honest, because it like, you know, I guess you hang around long enough, you meet a bunch of people, but um, yeah, it's cool to see everyone here. Thank you for coming to my talk. And my talk is about conscious bossing, which is a, you know, not funny enough to make you laugh, but a funny way of saying conscious leadership for the purposes of the name of the talk. So I'll be talking about what conscious leadership is um, and the journey it's, it, it's sort of taken me on. And I hope you weren't expecting sort of a keywords corporate presentation because this is mostly memes and pop culture and spelling mistakes. So if that's not your thing, you should probably just get out now because it's, <laughs> that's where we're headed. <laughs> uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, of course, the Wur Wurundjeri people. Uh, pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the elders um, past, present, and emerging, emerging. I'd also like to pay respects to the Ghana people um, of the South Australian region, which is where we get the privilege, they, they are the traditional custodians of the land on which we get the privilege of making our games at Tantalus South, so I just thought I'd start by recognising that. So what am I talking about today? It's a little bit of my background, We'll start with that. I won't go too long on that. The feedback I got on the first time I gave this talk was that it was way too much about me, so I'll try and get through that quickly. Um, and a little bit about why you should care about what I'm saying. Hopefully you do care. I can't force you to care, but I really hope you do, because this means a lot to me, this stuff. We'll talk about what conscious bossing is, why it's important to me, as I said, the virtues and values of what conscious leadership is. We'll talk about some of the challenges that it can bring with it. Um, and how you can become a conscious leader or a conscious team member, because I think it feels like this talk is aimed at leadership, people in leadership or people looking to get into leadership, but it's really not. It, it covers a lot of beh behaviours around how you can be a good conscious team member and how you can make, be part of making a better team. So hopefully I land that trick for you. Um, and then I'll wrap up with some questions if I don't burn the clock, which I almost certainly will. Uh, I would like to add, some of this is a little bit difficult to talk about at GCAP because I, I do tell a few anecdotes of like stuff that's happened along my journey. Um, and it does sort of, in, it probably involves either people in this room or people that know people outside this room. So please don't take that as an attack. This is it's like those, those anecdotes that I tell are about learning and how I've learned to be better based on some of the mistakes I was involved in or experienced. It's not a bitch session. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, some of you might enjoy that bit of it, sure, fine, whatever. <laughs> Who is this guy and why should I care, I hear everybody asking, which is a valid question. So I'm Kim Forrest. I am the fortunate and hardworking and lovable and extremely modest <laughs> head at Tantalus South in Adelaide. Um, lots of you know me as Kimbo, which is my preferred moniker, but as I've gone higher up the chain of... Uh, Management, people feel less comfortable calling me that. So lots of people call me Kim these days as well. Anyway, as you can see, I'm not an artist. Um, I've always lived this way with terrible looking slides. Uh, but Jason Tam managed to make this one actually shine a little bit. This is the best set of slides. For an insight into my history, this is the best looking set of slides I've ever done that's really been put together by myself. So I'm kind of proud of that too. But thanks to Jason for the help there. Um, so I, I started out at Rat Bag Games in Adelaide back in the year 2000, which, which feels like a long time ago. Uh, I worked at Chrome Studios in Adelaide and in Melbourne and then helped out with the Brisbane stuff as well. I worked for Six Foot Kid, which was a half brick studio. Uh, I worked at Mighty Kingdom for a long time and now I'm the blessed uh, head of Tantalus South, which is, which is the best job I've ever had at games. But you know, that's not saying much because they've all been pretty good. Like it's been a pretty good run for me. Um, but it is an incredible opportunity at Tantalus South because I get to do it in the city that I love, which is Adelaide, with a very trusted team that I've been allowed to build around me with the support of 
the, the incredible work that Tantalus did before us and Wicked Workshop and that we're, we're building on something that's like really a part of the, the Australian game development fabric, which is really proud for me as well. Um, and remember though, this is, this is a presentation from me. This doesn't represent anyone else's views. This is, this is my stuff. Okay. <laughs> so conscious leadership, what is it? It's a concept that's been around for a long time and it's a well-established concept. It's really strong, it's really a valid concept that's evolved over many years from a, different, a bunch of different types of leadership. Um, and really what it is, the, the, the core parts of it are about being present in every interaction you have with the team. Um, recognizing and acknowledging, acknowledging your own behaviors, like being good at self-assessment as much as you can. Um, encouraging growth within the team, delegating within the team. To build, that, to build out that trust and growth and let the team learn from their own mistakes and things like that. It's about using care and love um, and behaviors related to that in a professional sense. Thank you so much. Um, it's fine, it's fine. Thank you, I do need water. Um, yeah, it's about care of love, and, and that helps to create a really functioning, high-functioning team and environment for your team to function within. This is seamless, this bit. Um, <laughs> thank you, team, for the water. That's very nice of you. Um, so there's similar forms of this, this sort of leadership. This sort of leadership sort of landed in 2000 when a bunch of American companies realized that the, the hierarchical, like, boss and subordinate vibe wasn't really getting the results that they were hoping for. So this sort of evolved out of that. But the original version of this was, servant, was called servant leadership, um, which it was around from the 70s. And it, and it says what it is there, right? It's about servicing your team to, to get somewhere. And you'll see that right throughout the talk. Um, and, it, and that was actually part of a religious movement, but then moved into business and, and proved to be really successful. And then transformational, authentic leadership, a few other different forms started to revolve around that. This is my version of conscious, and it has a little bit of, it has a little bit of all of those in it, what you're about to hear. And like talking on the Tuesday, your voice is already gone. <laughs> Makes it harder. So this is one of my favorite fictional conscious leaders. I'm a huge Ted Lasso fan, and that, that quote there, um, is really poignant when it comes to what conscious leadership is about. It's a, it is about being curious and not judgmental. Um, and that is like really why I love to lead in a conscious way. Um, and the reason, I, the reason I got into games was because I love games, but what I really realized was that I loved working with games teams, watching people thrive and, and, and just be their best selves. And I believe that conscious leadership allows me to live this life professionally every day when I get it right. Um, I never really thought about how I led people when I was sort of doing it until I sort of got to a level where it's like, I should actually be more thoughtful about this and find out what kind of leader I am. Um, so I started to research it like about two years ago. And for all these years, it turns out that I've been, a, uh, I've been leading creative teams with conscious leadership, a, a, a concept that's it's relatively new, but I happen to be doing it for 20 years. And, and, and that's because like the values of it are a core part of who I am. And this will sound, this talk might be a bit, feel a bit preachy, but this is really about me sort of pushing out there. Like, this is how I think it should be done. If you agree, try and learn this way. I mean, I think I'm preaching to the choir here a fair bit anyway, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely a huge part of how I go about things in my day-to-day -day interaction with people. But this is just one version of leadership. There's a bunch of others that you should check out too. This is another one of my favorite fictional conscious leaders. And that quote really sums up my life. <laughs> Um, I don't think I'd be around without being helped from in lots of parts of my life. So I really love the way that Luffy goes about things and that, that quote is really poignant, I think. Um, yeah, so conscious leadership, it allows me to build relationships, it allows me to build momentum and pull people together to push in a collective uh, direction towards a goal. And it really, the, the, my favorite thing about it is it allows me to set people up for success by seeing them use their expertise to solve hard problems. Um, and it leverages this following statement, which I think is really great. History has taught us that this is the way we do it is a philosophy set in a tradition of failure. So again, that speaks to that be curious, not judgmental. Go and find answers because the answer you have, it could be the right one, but there might be a better one. And the way you did it last time, it might have worked, but it might, there might be a better one. And really what it speaks to is that idea that we don't have the answers yet, but we can go and find them. Um, 
And that really fits so well with game dev for me, right? Because we, in a, in a you know, that's the bigger your teams get in game dev, the more they're made up of varied skill sets, like re with, with really solid domain expertise, right? So me pretending that I can make decisions for those different domains of expertise is just ridiculous. Um, so conscious leadership forces you to lean into the expertise on your team. All right, I'm actually getting through this quicker than I thought I would, which is good. So there's a concept in conscious leadership and it's kind of at the core of it. And it refers to being above and below the line. Um, people tend to exist um, above or below the line and more of us sadly tend to exist below it. Um, but for conscious leadership, or for conscious leaders, or better yet, for pretty much everyone who wants to think about how they can improve their mental positioning during the day, it's really important to understand where you sit in relation to the line. Um, this is one of the self-awareness tools that I try to use on the daily, because I, I have days where I wake up and I'm like, oh man, I don't want to, I'm not here today, I'm not feeling great. And then I start to think about like, how can I get myself above the line? So we'll talk a bit, little bit about the line in a second. Because Another part of this, which, I, which is you know, a variation between human beings that I've noticed, is that this is dependent on a growth mindset. This is dependent on a mindset that you can move away from the current method of thinking you're in and you can get better and you can improve yourself. And again, like I said, this is daily for me, like sometimes hourly working on this stuff because you, you, fall above and below, you fall below the line and climb above it depending on anything that's going on in your life from work to family to, every, to your friends to whatever's happening. Um, so it's something you've really got to work on. So I borrowed this art from a great artist that, which I, will give, I do give credit to at the end. And, and this is actually a cool animation that goes for a while that you should check out on YouTube. But um, essentially when you're below the line, you're focused on winning, you're focused on being right, um, you're focused on like not having enough of everything, not enough time, not enough people, not enough whatever it is. Um, and you start to tell yourself stories of negativity and you start feeling overwhelmed by everything that's going on around you. You start to blame, you start to look for fault, you start to gossip and you start to white ant good things that might be happening around you. Um, and that really leads to that. That overwhelmed feeling leads to being combative and, and not collaborative. When you're above the line, you're a clown, apparently, according to this drawing. <laughs> you, you, and, and you know, it's not actually untrue. Like, because you're, being play, you're trying to be playful, you're trying to be curious, you're trying to go on the journey and the adventure. You start listening more deeply to people, you start putting more effort into other people, um, and you start leaning into the collaboration of it. And in a, in a sort of, I like to think of it in, a, in an improv comedy sense, you start yes anding more of what you're hearing and less and you do less no butting, which is the opposite of moving things forward in my opinion. So you're more playful with your choices and your behavior. And then what happens is you've stopped focusing on winning, but as a group, you start to win together without being focused on it. Thirstiness is real. The tough thing about, the tough thing about below the line though, is that it's a very primal state. Um, it's, and you know you hear this a lot in like self-help stuff, but that thinking about winning is is built into us over millions of years. To, to because winning meant that you got to stay alive, um, and you were in, more in control. And control was more important before in the before times. Um, so it was really built to to keep us from being like ostracized from the tribe, and you know, to a lesser extent, I hope, being eaten by a giant scary monster. Um, <clears throat> So really, being above the line is actually unnatural for human beings to do. So it takes a lot of effort to think about where I'm sitting every day. But in my opinion, it leads to the modern version of winning. Um, so just like, try, like if you want to take away from this a talk, um, try and use this in your daily choices. Think about where you sit in the line paradigm um, when you can. And then think about it with your with your team members and if you're a leader, you're the people that you're leading, like where are they sitting today? How can I help them get out of that place that they're in? Um, and yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a really, it's been a really useful tool, but you have to realize that people are gonna fluctuate no matter how much they practice it. So I'm gonna tell some anecdotes that again are not, not aimed at anyone, blaming anyone, this is just stuff that's happened to me. Um, but 
these are really stories of missing opportunities to set people up for, up for success because I think a huge part of conscious leadership is about supporting people to set them up to succeed. And when I've seen that not happen, it's like a tragedy. It's, it's, it's like the missed opportunities to do it just leave everyone in, in a state of disarray. So a large part of this is like 75% on me, by the way. I'm not pinning this. Like I take a lot of blame for this story because it was on me to get it right. But I think there's like 25% of it that can probably be pinned on the lack of conscious leadership that was around me at the time. I'd been designing games for a while. Um, I'd done a bunch of stuff. I felt pretty cool. I felt like I'd done some things. Um, I was still sort of the nervous, anxious character that you see in front of you today. But um, I felt like I was getting there, you know, in the industry. I'd done some, I'd done some good things. And I was told, You're going, we're going over to pitch this game to a pretty big player. Back then, you know, it was probably over a million dollars equivalent or something today, which felt pretty big. We're going over to this big player. So. I, I reached out to, the, to some senior people in the company to help me with this pitch. I had a pretty tight pitch already, um, but it was, a, it was like a read-along deck. It was not a stand-up and, and do the dog and pony show sort of pitch. So I asked for help once and got a sort of like, ah, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. They already love it, it'll be a conversation. I was like, really? That doesn't feel right. <laughs> and then I asked again, and it was like, just wing it, you know, just make stuff up. And I... I so what I, I tried to clean up the deck, tried to make it more presentable. It certainly was not. Um, and we went to pitch and it bombed pretty hard. We ended up getting the deal through different, through different, for different reasons, but that's not important right now. Um, but it bombed and it, should, it didn't have to. Because um, all it really needed was like four or five hours from someone who knew what was going to be expected when we got there, from someone who'd seen some of this stuff before, um, to just to support me in like, hey, Let's do it like this. Here's an example. We, back then, this is, we didn't have like 10,000 10, TED Talks of like, this is how you do a good pitch. That just didn't exist yet. So the, the, the resources probably weren't there, but it, it just understanding what they'd seen before and give me that support um, would have been really useful in that situation. So <clears throat> that really comes down, like that's a great example and it speaks to this, this concept, um, which you know, my number one KPI, I know I saw Tom walk into the room, he probably disagree with me, my KPIs, but th this, this, is <laughs> this, this is the number one KPI that helps me reach those KPIs. And that is supporting my team. Um, being able to, if, I'm, if I know I'm supporting my team and giving them the best chance of setting them up for success, my profit KPIs, my, my staff retention KPIs, all those things start to take care of themselves. And I, and I stop focusing on winning those KPIs and I start focusing on my team winning and then I get to share in that success, which feels great. Um, and how do I know if I'm doing this? Like, it's kind of hard. It's a bit ethereal and you have to get good at it. But... You know, you can tell by the way the project, like there's some pretty simple tells. The, the way the project, even though there's other contributing factors to these things, but the way the projects are going, how the team's reacting, the dynamics of the team. If I'm paying attention, I can see this stuff in, right in front of me. Um, the mood of the team. So I'm trying to remind myself that the team needs me all the time to try and support them um, in every possible way I can. And that's about setting them up for success, right? Um, and then what starts to happen is, and you'll hear a bit more about this later, but by osmosis, the team starts to feel that vibe and starts doing it for each other as well. And it just becomes a natural part of your team's culture. This is a Simpsons reference from 30 plus years ago. <laughs> so what are the virtues of a conscious leader? Um, keep your eye out for spelling mistakes as well. Um, <clears throat> I, again, I, I'm kind of lucky because I, like, I push these virtues hard inside myself, I feel like I'm sort of, this is a big part of who I am. Sure, I have really bad qualities too, but these, these are the important ones that I try and keep going back to. Um, and they're the sort of things I look for in my friends and, and try and instill in my children. They're the sort of things I look for when I'm hiring someone, um, which is hard to f really dig into, but certainly is. Yeah, I try to live these day to day. So being purpose-driven, um, clear goals, um, clear communication, clear outcomes so that your people can have a feeling of impact is really important. Because one of the things I've learned is you, people aren't buying into what you're selling them, they're buying into the purpose of the direction or the project, right? Like, I've had, there's people in this room who I've wanted to hire and haven't because I maybe haven't articulated that that well, but 
defining an authentic purpose and reiterating it consistently and constantly is really important. Okay, because when people know what, you, what they're expect, is expected of them, they can go and do it. Leading with authenticity. So this is fairly simple. It's like, do what you say, say what you do, and deliver on that as best you can. So it's sort of walk the walk, talk the talk thing. Um, <clears throat> and please don't fake it till you make it. Uh, it's, a, it's a phrase said often that I don't love. Certainly try and push yourself out of your comfort zone and do things, take things on that you're not great at or you've never tried before. But if you don't know someone, ask the expert sitting next to you. Find an expert to consult with. Find a mentor to help you, right? Because um, that's how you learn faster and that's how you get there quicker. So being real, like, because you'll get found out and then people are like, oh, you pretended to know that. Like, there's just reasons why not. So that's just part of that authenticity vibe. Like, be real. Be loving and caring um, in a professional sense, of course. Um, always have boundaries. But again this, again, this is sort of an easy one. It's easier to be kind to people than it is to be mean to people. Like, so you be direct and be straight with people and say what you mean, but also try and do it with love and care. Um, because it makes you feel better about yourself, in my opinion. Like I've seen the sort of nasty cycle start and then people say something real stingy and then they want to go home because they're like, oh my God, I'm a jerk. So. The more you can practice being nice, the better you're gonna feel about yourself and the, and the better the team's gonna function. It's not all just touchy-feely. Because you know, this is kind of a, a sort of a thing that I live by, I try to live by every day, is that like, I think people get caught up in the big moments of creating success through big moments, but I actually think success comes through like putting effort into the little, the little moments all the time. This is the one, this is obviously the slide that I definitely did myself and nobody touched. <laughs> can you tell? Sorry. Emotional intelligence, this is like, this is, you know, it's sort of the buzzword of the last 10 years. Um, but this, and this is like, again, it comes super naturally to some people, it doesn't to everyone. But this is really just about understanding people and engaging with them in the ways that they want to be engaged with and using empathy, using your social skills and your self-regulation and stuff like that to try and get those interactions right. Um, if, you, if you're not good at this, I think conscious leadership is going to be really hard for you. Um, but it's, I think, again, with that growth mindset, I think it's something that everyone can get better at. Um, so I think this is everyone, everyone should be working on this part of their game all the time. It's okay if it doesn't cut, na come naturally to you, but you should really try to get it right. And by the, uh, by the same token, I think uh, people that are really good at it get upset with people who aren't. And I think it, there's a responsibility on people that have natural EQ, high EQ, to make allowances and support people that don't have it. And I've fallen into that trap before because I am blessed in that I'm pretty good at that people side of things, that I've been like, why can't you do this? And that person's like, because I just can't. Um, and then I just pin it on them. And so, so, you know, I've learned a lot about like really making allowances for those people. Um, and one of, the thing, one of the reasons I think that um, emo emotional intelligence is so important is because video game development creates crisis a little bit, right? I'm sure everyone's felt it. And I think, I think during a crisis, uh, the ability to have a cool head and to be able to understand when people are losing theirs is really important. So I think that's a really important part of, of good leadership, conscious leadership. Being service oriented, like I'll just, I'll skip past this pretty quick. This is about just delivering on the things you say you're gonna do, setting people up for success, serving their needs to be able to allow them to be able to do their jobs. And again, what that allows them to do best is not worry about the little problems that you can solve or other people supporting them can solve and allows them to take their domain expertise and execute regularly and consistently against the things you need them to do and they're not wasting their time. Also, in games, I've noticed <clears throat> when people get distracted by those things and they're not operating in their domain of expertise, you start to lose their motivation. So if you can avoid that by, by providing a service as a manager, I highly recommend it. Throat fading. Integrity, kind of authenticity as well, kind of aligned, I think. Um, at least for me it is. This is about honesty, being respectful for every, to everyone in your sphere, building trust, taking pride in your work, taking responsibility for your decisions, and again, delivering on what you say you're going to do, and just looking after people in general. Like, I think, you know, I don't need to do the dic dictionary definition of integrity, even though I just did. Um, 
But this this does actually this this uh, requires like a deprioritization of the self, and, and like a letting go of your ego because you're putting you, you're starting to look at putting people in front of you, um, which can be hard to do. So, the great thing is this is not just like touchy feely stuff that that someone just recently made up or something that I thought was cool, so I'd talk about it. There's empirical proof of this working over the journey. Sadly, there's not a lot of documented proof of it working in the games industry. Um, but I've seen it work, and I've seen it. I've seen when it's not being used. I've seen things fail. Um, so, but there's other. Te as I think, especially in tech, because of that like varied domain expertise stuff. There's examples of companies that have 10x their revenue from to like a quarter of, uh, sorry, 250 million dollars by employing a conscious leadership team and then rolling conscious leadership out over their group. Um, this person here is another sort of uh, affirmation slide for you to see. Simon Sinek, Sinek it's, his, it's, it's an unfortunate name because he's not cynical, but <clears throat> he sort of is a bit of a pusher of the conscious leadership vibe. And he has this great quote, um, when we work hard for something we, we don't believe in, it's called stress. When we work hard for something we love, it's called passion. So when you start to get your team rolling with this vibe of conscious leadership, they start to care more about it, they start to care more about the people in the team, and then you get better, you get better things out of them. How preachy am I? So what sort of behaviors or traits do you expect to see, special abilities in, conscious lead, in the conscious leadership environment? Um, so again, this is pulled, as I said, this is pulled from like a lots of different places, but um, Robert Greenleaf was one of the early founders of servant leadership. Um, and he's, he's sort of pushed it out into a bunch of businesses over that sort of <clears throat> last 25 years of the last century. Um, but this quote, I've talked about support, but this quote really nails it down. And this is the way that servant leadership is set up to, to, to work and that good leaders must first become good servants. So until you know how to serve the people in your team, um, you're going to struggle to become a good conscious leader. And when I said it's my number one KPI before, well, as a servant, you, you're, you're really prioritizing support to hit that KPI, right? Um, yeah, I can move on from that because you get it. I think you get it. So what is the detail of what you can recognize in a conscious leader and the results of those behaviors you'll see in the team? So if you push out a conscious mindset, use empathy, concern for the team and the team member's well-being, it fosters a really positive and supportive environment of trust and respect for your group. Um, actively listening, concerns, ideas, feedback allows you to make more informed decisions, which is about developing that understanding of the team needs and really understanding what the team's looking for from you and what the team's looking for to make the project a success. Promoting collaboration and teamwork, you'll see that from good conscious leaders all the time. Pushing unity and mutual respect, which is what I spoke about a bit earlier. Um, the team becomes cohesive and effective at, with all, all the time when you're pushing this stuff out, which is basically essentially pushing a team culture, a strong team culture. Um, oh, skipped it too quick. And then empowering team members. I talked earlier on about that growth of your team by empowering team members to take on responsibility, to look for resources, support, and that autonomy, which can be tricky in certain spaces because there's lots of boundaries that we play within, budgets, timelines, things like that. Um, but the fact that the team's pushing for those things and looking for it really means that you've empowered the team to be a strong uh, and, and, and grown up team, a mature team. And what happens is when you start leading by example like this and you pull in leaders around you that operate in the same way, it just starts to filter through, like I said, just by osmosis, people just get good at this in the team and people start to function really great. So you should see it spread. Another strong part of being a, a good conscious leader is knowing your people well. Um, <clears throat> collapsing throat. So it's a personally expensive way to lead. It's, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of energy from you because you, you're giving so much to the team. You're supporting. You're trying to push them up all the time. You're spending time to understand them. But if you take that time to actually understand their strengths and weaknesses and their ex levels of expertise in different areas, you can learn to understand their tells and when they're struggling. 
Um, but you can also put them on things that you're going to get the best work out of them with. Um, but when they're uncomfortable and they need support, if you know your team well, you can support them without even having to have the conversation. You can just put things in place. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the hard-ass boss is one way to to lead. Definitely, it's not it's not it's not it doesn't fall under conscious leadership. But the very the sort of harder boss subordinate vibe, it's it's been around for a long time. Um, but the challenge there, I think, is that conscious bossing allows you to hold people more accountable because they'll tell you the truth. The boss subordinate vibe creates an environment of fear, which then eventually leads to a place where you don't get all the information you need because people are like, if I tell Kimbo that, he's gonna flip out and I don't wanna see that. I don't like being yelled at, whatever. Um, so you can, I believe you can get great, greater transparency over, over problems. And you can still have those hard conversations, but they come from a place of care and, and respect as well, so that's easier to have too. All right, so what happens if I fail to be a conscious leader? Like, what will you see me doing if I've basically fallen below the line for a couple of days and my behaviors as a leader start changing? Um, it's pretty obvious in our, at Tantalus South, and luckily I have a, a, a really strong group of um, leaders in my team, and even the people that aren't in leadership positions yet, that will just say, uh, this is how we're supposed to do things, and we can have that conversation, and then I'm, ha I'm comfortable being reminded of when I'm getting it wrong. But basically, the things you'll notice is that I'll start to pull things closer to me. I'll tighten up, um, and the team can feel stuff, decisions, uh, lots of different things being pulled away from them because I'm like freaking out, so I start to tighten up on that. And then I become a bottleneck, right, where I'm making bad decisions because I don't have all the information they have. I'm slowing things down. It's bad mojo, essentially. Um, and in a conscious leadership state, I wouldn't do that. I'd be doing the opposite, obviously, from all the things we've discussed. So the other, uh, other parts of it are that I'll, I'll start to focus on the things we're getting wrong rather than the things we're getting right. Um, and essentially, people feel bad, and so do I, and it just, it just slows production down, essentially, um, is my experience with the, the teams I've operated in this way with. You could be, everyone become, I become de divisive, I, I become judgy and I start criticizing things, I'll blame things and, and the team starts to do that stuff too. And essentially what I describe that is, it's like you start to try and just take control, right? You try and control everything. And control is just, a, control is an absolutely imaginary idea in my, I, I believe. Like the thought that we're controlling much ourselves is pretty, it's pretty unrealistic. Um, all right. So now a couple of high, totally hypothetical things that have happened in a galaxy far, far away that have nothing to do with me or anyone in this room. Um, just some examples of like when memories from my past with people that in, a, in an imaginary world where people have not had that support. So, and the pitching, pitching has been a big part of my life, so I've seen a lot of pitching. So this probably happened somewhere. Um, the pitch was really good, it was done. It felt tight. Um, you know, a, few, a little a team had been on it, designers, artists, pro a producer. <clears throat> They'd asked for feedback from stakeholders for five days leading up to the pitch deadline. And then 16 hours away from delivery in the early hours of the morning before the close of business of the deadline, sweeping changes of feedback came through on the deck. No questions, no thoughts, no proposals, just a bunch of stuff to do. No mention of changing the delivery date of the pitch just an absolute sort of dog's breakfast of changes. Um, and you know, you'd think this would be obvious and it probably is to most people in this room, but the sort of five key things that that person could have done to, to stop the absolute disaster that ensued after this was to find time to prioritize the feedback if you're gonna give it at all. Like as a leader, if you wanna give feedback, make it timely and make it on target. Um, or at worst, delegate that to someone else that you trust in the organization. And I would argue also deliver a better brief because if there's that many changes, put more time into what you want the five days before the team starts. Um, don't f send feedback in the middle of the night. That's like a really rude thing to send to your team <laughs> and it's upsetting for them. Um, there's a certain level I think you get to where that's okay, but uh, but when it's, when it's a team that's been working real hard on something like this, it can be really, just take the knees out from underneath them. And I would argue also, in this case, I'm imagining that 
this was a critical piece of business work. So work, so like biz dev work. So engaging with the team earlier is really important to make sure that those changes happen over the journey and not right at the end. Um, and if you're going to be this person, I think you need to be prepared to, to change the date of delivery as well. All right. This is another little anecdote that may or may not have happened. So <clears throat> an executive producer thought that micromanaging was the answer and didn't really know how to do much else. And I think when I talk about opposites of, like it's a bit of a sort of old encompassing word, but when I think about opposites of conscious leading, I think about micromanagement. Um, anyway, a very competent producer and team and this micromanaging was going on and the team was on the receiving end of this. There was meeting after meeting after meeting because I think this person felt their only way of control was to just be in constant contact with people. What that resulted in was very little time to actually do any work, so it was kind of working against it. Um, but the project was running late. There wasn't time to do everything. The producer get, kept talking about pulling levers that we do in games industry, right? drop some features, discuss with the publisher about what we might be able to shift to next milestone, so on, so forth. But it fell on deaf ears. At the same time, the producer just had too much to do and was saying to this EP, I need help, I can't do this. And all through the meetings, the producer would be like, that sounds terrible, okay, okay, we're gonna go do it, let's go do it. And it was just absolutely like no change. Um, so, more pressure being heaped on this team through the producer. The producer feels it and pushes it down to the team. And you know, this, this speaks, I think, to that fear, uh, that fear ch link in the chain, where this EP was afraid to tell the stakeholders above them that things were going wrong, or to tell the publishers or whatever. There was it was fear-driven decision making. <clears throat> so, here's the five things they could have done differently. Too much contact implies a lack of trust. If you have to have a meeting after meeting after meeting, it means you're not, it's micromanaging, you're not letting your people do it. You need to allow time for the team to do the work and to figure out the problems and come back to you with solutions and you need to hear the solutions. You need to stop trying to control things. When deadlines are slipping, you need to start, to looking, at, start looking at alternatives to deadlines. Um, taking that information from where you're getting it and prioritize, get more resources, try and find a way to change things. And that's really about listening and supporting, right? It's about having your ears on. Rather than just blindly plugging on, um, find ways to take that overloaded producer and give them a break. Um, take some of the work if you need to on yourself. It's not the ideal way to do it, but if you're capable of it, it's, it's an option. Be transparent with stakeholders. Like, the, the worst moments in my career really have been when I've, when I've been not honest and as early as possible had the discussion with a stakeholder about a problem. Um, <clears throat> and the end of this story really is they shipped a mediocre game and the producer resigned and a few other people resigned as well because it just, it just killed this team and they were like, I don't want to work here anymore. <laughs> okay. Challenges, I hope my voice holds out to the end of this. Challenges and pitfalls. So. It's not all smiles and sunshine. How long do I have? Am I going over? I'm nearly there, aren't I? Um, if people have been conditioned with a hard-ass boss, they can sometimes not realise what conscious leadership looks like, and it takes a lot of work to recondition. Oh, thank you, Giselle. Um, and they can actually, you know, when, the, when it becomes flat, they can actually forget that they have a boss altogether and start to, start to make bad decisions based on the idea of, like, no one tells me around what to do around here. I do whatever I want. Um, so conscious leadership can become a bit of a shock to people and you, lose, you, you can lose a bit of shape of that hierarchy. So you really need to find a balance of like reminding people of the hierarchy, that they're empowered to make decisions, but you and the, or the leadership team are the ones that are accountable and responsible for the actual outcomes and will be the ones that have the final say if a final say needs to be had. If it doesn't just naturally form. Um, so you do have to exhibit that authority in a, different, in a, bit, of a bit of a different way. Generally, this isn't a huge problem for mature teams, I don't think, but you do have to keep pushing these values down of like, yes, you're in control, you own this bit of the game, but you, there's still this hierarchy here that we, you have, we have to exist within. There's still these boundaries that we're still operating within. And you do that through one-on-ones, through discussions in meetings and just pushing that home. Um, 
And, you know, beyond that, you have to recognize when someone isn't fitting into the mold as well, because occasionally there's people that just don't want to work this way. Um, so if they're not responding well to that conscious leadership vibe, you have to give them opportunities to understand the lay of the land and really explain it to them. And then, of course, if they don't get it still, then you have to have those tough discussions about what happens next if that person is threatening the success of your team or your project. So sometimes as a manager, you do have to do something horrible and have, and have those really tough conversations. But I think that um, from both sides, in my opinion at least, again, this is just the opinions of Kimbo, but the underlying behaviours of conscious leadership make these conversations easier because you've built trust, you've, built, you've shown care, and then you can have those conversations in an easier way because of that professional love and care that you put into it. Um, the other side of that as well is that it opens up the relationship into spaces that maybe blur the lines between professionalism and friendship, which can also be a tough part of conscious leadership. Um, so you might get people approaching you with problems that are potentially not appropriate for work or whatever. Um, and in that situation, you just have to be able to really look after yourself mentally, um, emotionally and professionally, make sure those boundaries are there. Um, but also, if, if it's the right environment and you're comfortable supporting someone with a personal problem, I think that's okay too, as long as it doesn't get weird. <laughs> okay, I've got to move it along. So this is a quote from Makokuma Mokonawana. He is a modern philosopher that I find really interesting and funny. Um, and that quote is, one of the main functions of jargon is to exaggerate expertise. And this is definitely, this is definitely a pitfall of conscious leadership because because you're like exercising that, that organ in your body of, of like self-doubt and all those things that kind of make me a good conscious leader, I think, like the sort of imposter syndrome where it's like, I don't know enough about that. I'm going to go ask this person or this person's coming to the room. They sound like they know a lot of stuff. Um, you can, because of that really trusting nature of a good conscious leader, you can get duped every now and then by a false idol. Um, if they're speaking jargon, then and, and they realize you're not going along with it or you, can, you question them about it, then you, you can smell, that's a, that smell on their breath isn't great. It's, uh, it's ball plop. So you have to be able to really figure out who the imposters are. It doesn't very, happen very often, but it can happen because people get good at the talk. Um, so you need to develop that detector. Um, but also I really love the fact that good conscious leaders ha are humble about ideas and all that sort of stuff and are looking to learn. So you just need to develop systems or trusted people around you that can help double check these things. Get second opinions. The only other real sort of challenging bit of this is that the better you're doing as a conscious leader, the less it appears you're doing. Um, because your team's formed up and it's strong and it can sort of run itself in lots of ways. They trust each other, they trust the processes that they've got, they believe in the purpose that you put in front of them, they believe in themselves and they believe in the people around them and they care about each other. So lots of what you're doing is just like pushing things up and you know, often it's just like, oh, I've got this idea and this idea, which one do you think I should do? And I'm like, well, which one do you think you should do? And they're like, this one, and I'm like, I agree. <laughs> and it's like, that's all you need. That's all you, they need from you sometimes. So it is really a cliche, but conscious leadership is about making yourself redundant as a, as a manager, essentially. It's like building people to move you on, which is kind of terrifying in some ways. I wish I'd never said that out loud now. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the takeaways are conscious leadership is about diminishing fear and inferiority and insecurity and toxic behavior, which undoes apprehension in your team. Um, it's about building trust, bringing greater transparency, which creates efficiency in your team. And, you know, for, for, the, for the younger punters in the room, I'm sorry to say this out loud, but this industry can bring scar tissue to people. Um, and stuff that needs to be like unlearned and like worked out of them. But I think that conscious leadership really helps heal that stuff in people if they're led in the right way. Um, which, are lead, which leads you to unlocking that expertise. Because when the fear goes away, people just start focusing on the problems and then they, and they start solving really complex problems. So try to be vulnerable, try to use love and care as a management tool. Um, encourage growth at every opportunity, 
really try to delegate. Use your, use your um, EQ as much as you can. Encourage, encourage that, that intelligence in people. Create and communicate that shared purpose and the goals. Be direct with your people. <clears throat> and at every moment, think about how you can service them to make a better team, to set them up for success, because that's what it's really about. And when they succeed, you get to succeed, and you look amazing. And you didn't really do anything. <laughs> <clears throat> do the things you can do daily, which is like, where am I on the line? How am I feeling about this? Wake yourself up in the morning and go, I feel terrible. Um, by lunchtime, I'm going to try and get above the line and think differently about how today's going to go. Because what this allows us to do is lubricate the wheels of progress, which everyone hates me saying, but it's my favorite <laughs> saying. <laughs> and um, it does. It allows, you to, it, it allows you to move things forward in a really cool way where people feel great about the things they're doing every day. They feel like they're having impact, and so do you. And the final thought I'll leave you with on that is that to remember that conscious leadership is not passive, it's not altruistic, and it's not permissive. It's inclusive and wise. And those two words are really important when it comes to conscious leadership. Inclusivity and using wisdom um, are really part of what you've got to do, all types of wisdom. All right, these are my sources, which you can probably see on the video, or I can send you some links if you're really keen. And that's it, and I reckon we've got like three, two minutes for questions, but I'll be around for today and tomorrow if you want to catch up with me as well. Hello. Yes. Any questions? Yes, Erica. Hi. First time caller. Yeah, I think that, that's a really good question. I think that um, there's like pretty much everything going on around you in the studio. Ah, did everyone hear that question? I don't know if I can repeat it. It was a long boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, how, like, what are the other ways you can measure success? <laughs> Sorry, Sarah, I shouldn't tease. Um, pretty much everything going on around you in the studio is probably an indicator. But I think, I think that's where, depending on team size, I think that's where other good having other good uh, barometer, human barometers around you to be able to read problems and report back to you and running one-on-ones and things like that. But, you know, for Tantalus South, we have, a, we have a two days at home, three days in the studio ideal policy. And, you know, I think you can start to see, oh, when people do a few more work from home days, maybe that's slipping there. I try and use every little measure, but especially, you know, how the prog project's going how the interactions between the teams look in, in daily stand-ups, like, like hardcore emotional intelligence, being able to read people is a big part of it, which is why I did say, if you're not good at that, conscious leadership is harder. Because without conscious leadership, you can just tell everyone what to do and hope that they do it. And if they don't, yell at them. But with conscious leadership, it's a lot more nuanced, I think. I hope that helps. Yes. How do you deal with remote workers where you can't be around their energy or notice that they're like slowly dipping below the line? Um, that's <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's tough. Uh, because it is, it's like a new, it's, it's the new normal, right? Like it ain't going away, I don't think, especially in this industry, because one of the advantages you get from it is that you get to bring talent into your team that's not necessarily in your city. Um, but I think, again, this, like, this comes down to like, like I said before, it's an expensive way to manage. Um, it takes a lot of your time. It takes a lot of the time of the leaders around you. So really, it takes effort to check in with them. I think some of the things we try to do is like a, a morning and then an after a morning team stand up, like no no must happen, and then in the afternoon people are checking in 
at least once again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I, I, sadly, I can't tell you exactly how to do that because it is a really tough problem. And I do know that some people thrive on that remoteness and some people just don't, don't cope well with it. So it's, yeah, it's a tough one, but I think it's about contact, which is costly, but valuable. Yes. I don't know if you've like heard of a podcast called Normal Gossip, but there's this idea that like talking about things in a frank and safe environment is actually a positive. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts about like conscious gossip or like how to have those <laughs> frank conversations in a way that's healthy. Or maybe you disagree with the whole premise entirely. No, I don't. Uh, so that that question was about like, is all gossip bad essentially? It was like there's some good gossip. And I think, you know, Jason Ims here is a is a big proponent of venting you know which is you know which can which can be misconstrued as like evil um, especially for a manager because generally it probably involves the manager or something related to a decision a manager's made or whatever so and I don't I think it's I think it's a healthy thing I think the gossip I was talking about was more like really trying to you know more sustained and endemic and trying to turn things against the direction of where things are going and that sort of white ant like consistent white anting of ideas or a person. But, you know, um, I think healthy, healthy venting, where it's like, that really pissed me off sort of thing, that's fine. So long as it's being managed well and it, it doesn't become consistent and themed over a long period of time where it's always about Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Yeah. Hello. Do, is this is this leadership motivated mo, motivated by the leader or the people on the team? Um, I wish I had like a straight answer for you on that because I think I actually think that it depends on the team, which is a bit of a cop out. But I think that generally, uh, if you don't have a leader that's into it, it ain't going to happen because that leader doesn't want to hear what you've got to say. Probably, but yeah, that's probably a bit extreme. But I think it needs to be led by the leader. Um, to start with, but I mean, I feel like at GCAP, I'm preaching to the converted here anyway, so I think it would, you know, you wouldn't find many people here that don't agree with the ways I, I generally the ways I like to do things. Um, but I think the important bit, the more important bit, I think, is like really trying to hammer home to your team that this is how you're going to do it and then explaining it to them. Because I have, I've, there's been moments where I've failed at that. And it gets, it can get, it can wheel out of control real quick. So you have to get it right. We done? Okay. So thank you everyone again. Amazing, so many great faces. Thank you so much.